Welcome to Sky Team's The Corporate Bartender. If you work in HR or make people decisions in your organization, this is the place to be. Now pull up a stool, belly up to the bar, and join us for The Corporate Bartender. All right. Well, let's get started, everybody, shall we? Hi. Let's get into it. This is Corporate Bartender, episode number 50. Dang. Holy cow. Wow. I know, right? 50. Wow. wow. Well, in that case, cheers. <laughs> As Morag says, cheers, big ears. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And today, as you know, we've got special guests. We've got, do we have anybody new here today? I, I had some people threatening to come. I don't see any newbies on the list. So we'll just jump right on into the agenda. This is today's. We no virgin. will No, no virgins today. <laughs> yes, I was fully prepared to sacrifice them. Um, we're going to talk to uh, to Patrick Nelson today about servant leadership. Oh, look, there is a newbie. There is a newbie joining. So we're going to talk to Patrick about about servant leadership in difficult times. Um, hey, Mariah. Mariah Eric. McCarty. Holy moly. Karen. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. See what I see what happens on the bartender? You never know. <laughs> so Mariah, why don't you, if you don't mind, I'm putting you great on the spot right out of the gate. Um, just tell us who you are, um, what you do, and hey. uh one one fun fact about Mariah McCarty. Oh, okay. Well, I wasn't prepared for that piece. Um nah. <laughs> so I uh in Mariah McCarty, I am a senior recruiter, HR business partner, have been in HR since 2002, where I actually met Karen Sebring and Eric. I worked directly for <laughs> Karen uh, and supported her team of the business partners in which Eric was on. So we go back a long ways, almost 20 years now. I That's crazy to me. Um, yeah. It's way scary. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Mar Mar Mariah was like fresh out of school and yeah. now she's a legitimate grown up and everything. There you go. <laughs> um, One, what's fun your fact. fun fact, Mariah? <laughs> I it was a pig farmer. Wow. Okay. Any, anyone, anyone want to probe that one a little bit or we're we just going to let too. that one out? We had pigs growing up. <laughs> so I, I hear you. You're it's great. Good. Yep. Yeah, but Jenny, you live in Nebraska. Everybody. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, before we get into into Patrick's topic, as always, just a quick look at the headlines. Um, you know, we talked last week about the school situation, and surprise, surprise, um, I could have filled up another slide with with the news items from the last twenty four hours. Um, that I pulled. You now, New Jersey was was doing uh, in person learning had to be a part of their of their plan, and the governor reversed that today. Um, Twenty four students, thirteen employees, uh, test positive in Columbia County, Georgia. Another uh, Georgia county has quarantined nine hundred and twenty five people in a week. They opened last week. 17 uh, cases in Louisiana that in one county that opened last week. Uh, for the locals here, uh, Mapleton teacher test positive. Um, as, as students uh, come back, I think it's next week, or no, August 27th, it says there. Um, yeah, sorry, parish, Leah. I, I know, Louisiana doesn't have counties. They have parishes. <laughs> I'm from Virginia. It's not a state. It's a commonwealth. I know. I know. I'll mess it up. Um, and then sports, right? We've had two of the big uh, Power Five conferences at least postponed till spring. A host of smaller conferences have already, have already uh, postponed or canceled. I saw University of Connecticut just canceled everything. Um, so <laughs> last week we, we addressed the topic and I don't know, I don't know how far we got down that road. Um, 
but we commiserated a little bit. Um, I think I think it's it's suffice it to say it's it's bananas right now, and I think it will be bananas for a little while. All right. <laughs> Laurel says it's okay. Most voters don't know the U.S. is a republic and not a democracy. It's true. They don't. <laughs> Oh, so framing question for today. I was just curious, who uses servant leadership or service-based leadership principles as part of their company's operations or values? Is it something that you teach in your leadership development programs? Is it something that is a, is a corporate value for you? Is, is it something that, that you guys are even aware of that you, you think about? Just kind of curious as to where everybody stands on the topic of servant leadership or service-based leadership? I'm still stuck on that phrase, leadership training. <laughs> Not doing a lot of that, are you? <laughs> Does anybody yeah, use it? Go ahead, Ben. I do. I, I, I do and and I have. I find that, you know, leadership is really just, for me, it's based around how you communicate, but also how you organize. But I think servant-based leadership, you know, we tell a lot of people when they're trying to connect with a group, connect with other people, you know, don't put yourself on a pedestal. When I think of servant leaders, I think of people who try to be the pedestal for other people. Mm. And so that's just kind of how I frame it and how I like to talk about it. Uh, A lot of ego removal, a lot of... Um, you know, I think you were talking about in your tiny habits, the importance of celebrations, no matter how small mm. servant leaders right. uh, that I've worked with that have been really good are very good at finding those small things to celebrate because they make you feel they make you feel good about yourself. And they make you want to be better. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of my small experience with it. Oh, excellent. Thank you for that. Who else? Who else is using principles of servant leadership? I think Spence, I've seen it embedded into some of the, a lot of companies, their values, like what they put out there from a collaboration, communication, mm-hmm. um, you know, whether it's celebrating success. So I think leaders that are, you know, servant leaders will typically, you know, I think gravitate towards a lot of those, even though it's, it's servant leadership can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Um, and that's yeah. what that I think makes it even more unique. So I'm interested to hear what, you know, how, how Patrick sort of describes or how he, um, you know, embeds that into organization he works with. But I think certainly every leader wants to be seen as someone that is a, um, a collaborator, a team player. Uh, they're mm-hmm. looking to lift others up, um, you know, and grow others in the organization, knowing that, you know, the more they surround themselves with, with talent that's remarkable, uh, it's going to make their job that much easier. So I think, For yeah, sure. I think there's a, there's a lot of that. And then having worked in commercial and sales organizations, um, customer always comes first, right? So if you think about it from looking at your customers, servant leadership mentality, I think really comes in the form of of putting that customer at the center of everything. Too too often companies become myopic and they're so so inwardly focused, looking at the challenges they have versus okay, what's our CX right, or even what's our EX mm-hmm. when it comes to you know uh, how our, our leadership are operating yeah for sure you know it's funny brian i i I think about this concept of servant leadership a lot just in the context of hr right i mean as hr folks we rarely have position power to do to influence people to get anything done so it's kind of the way we have to show up in, in our roles right i i think about that a lot especially in the context of how things were in a very you know, sort of alpha dog dominant culture, like companies we've worked together yes. in the past for. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Anyone else uh, comments on on servant leadership or 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 service based leadership and how you using it in your organizations, or is it not being used and you wish it was? I think we have both, which is why hmm. we're going through management training and trying to get everyone on the same page. Um, I think Jeff as a servant leader. He leads by example. He believes in collaboration. He raises people up. He challenges you to grow. I don't think everyone that flows through our management team acts the same way. And we're trying to move more towards spreading that out. Um, but I mean, I, I, I see him as a lead by example leader. And I think that's how I show up. At least that's how I try to show up. 
Um, but I know it's been a, it's a struggle when you have some people that do it and some don't because you have different vibes and different groups based on how that leader might be portraying themselves or, or acting differently. For so sure. that's a struggle for us, I think. Yeah, I would concur. Ditto. Um, I think it's, it's something that motivates us. It's in our values. Um, it's in everything that we do and strive for, but I would say some people are more successful than others. And so we are, um, as Jenny said, um, we are uh, striving to all get on the same page um, and hopefully move forward um, with that in mind a little bit more. I think our hearts are in the right place, but <laughs> we're, we're still growing. <laughs> I love it. I, I, I think it. what what struck me in the conversation, we were talking about bad bosses before we really got started here. Right. And, um, just to be be clear, the person in my organization who leads training and development is a great servant leader by example. And actually, he and I do not share a reporting structure. So mm -hmm. it's you know we're um, so I can pick on him all day long and vice versa. We actually <laughs> work quite well together. But something that Brian said struck me that we all want to be seen that way. I think was at least a paraphrase of what he said. And I don't agree with that. I think everybody on this call feels yeah. that way. But I mm. routinely see leaders who want to be the leader. They want to be the boss. They're Got still, um, and, and I'm talking mostly about boomers, uh, those of mm. us who are older, um, who just really don't care what you think. Uh, and, <laughs> okay boomer <laughs> yeah and and uh that but that is still the mindset mm -hmm. and and it's that old-fashioned type a mentality whereas we've had to in hr at least regardless of our advanced age in my own case um go wait a minute this doesn't work you have to uh, part of my job is to get obstacles out of the way <laughs> for my team right right and and that ends up being a part of servant leadership i'll do this for you so that you can be successful nobody's ever going to know the part i did exactly but, and exactly and, I, mm -hmm. and that's so rewarding for me to watch my people succeed but i wish it was universal brian sure <laughs> See, gloves get thrown off. There's all kinds of fighting going on at the bartender. It's awesome. Listen, I, I'm just still trying to figure out if I'm, if I'm a boomer or not. You know, my kids call me that, but I just, I just, I don't know. You know, it's in my own mind. Wait, I'm still young. Shit, no, you're not. <laughs> you're an Xer, baby. You're an Xer. I, I am an Xer. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, I, I, I have been instructed that we've had another joiner, Lori. Yes. Hey, I just I just want to uh, acknowledge that we've had a, a new person join the group today. Her name is Tina Evangelista. If you want to say a quick hello, Tina, and let us know where you're from and maybe an interesting factoid about you. Oh, Lord. Um, you just put me on the spot. And interesting. It has to be interesting, too. That That's just subjective, horrible. Tina. It's subjective. Sure. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you can see me. I was playing around with my video. So, um, but yeah, you're good. Good. So teeny evangelist, I'm with cable one. I've been, um, I am the VP of human resources, been with cable one here in Phoenix or otherwise affectionately known as Hades. Um, <laughs> I've been with cable one for just about two years. I was with Intel for 23 years prior to joining and boy, I have tried to make it to these um, corporate bartenders and it's just the timing hasn't worked so I'm excited to come and show up um, I don't know about anything interesting these days right um, just trying to keep on keeping on and um, yeah but so I'm interested in the topic and excited to be here cool. right thanks for being here Tina thanks <clears throat> Thanks, Tina. From from your background, I can see that you're you're on uh, oceanfront Phoenix property there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Trying to find something interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. 
All right. <clears throat> well, let's get on into the topic. Today, we've got a special guest. It's this dude right here, Patrick <laughs> Nelson. Pa Patrick, Patrick's a guy. He's been around the block a time or two. Patrick was the uh, inaugural NFL Tillman Military Scholar, which is kind of a pretty big deal. He's won a Bronze Star and a Purple Heart. He, he has been engaged and involved in leadership development since his time in the service. And uh, I had, the, uh, had the, the good fortune of working with Patrick um, at another organization um, a couple of years ago. Gotten to know him pretty well. He's a good dude. Um, and I was thinking about this, this concept of servant leadership. And Patrick, he lives this. This is, this is what he does. Um, so I wanted, to, I wanted to see if he wouldn't mind joining us today and talking just a little bit about servant leadership, what it's like to lead in difficult times, um, and that whole scene. So Patrick, welcome. Thanks, Eric. Great to be here. All right. So, um, Patrick, you know, tell us just a little bit about you, your background, where where you came from, how you found yourself here in this situation right now. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I'm kind of what some of us like to say, an, an accidental leader. I wasn't uh, <laughs> born or, or bred to do great things in life. If you would have asked people when I was growing up, if I was going places in life, they would have said probably to jail. Um, had a pretty tough childhood, um, a lot of neglect, but certainly not the worst. Um, it, it could have been worse. Stumbled my way into a small junior college in West Central Minnesota. And uh, three weeks in, I was already skipping classes at a community college. Uh, it's safe to say I was headed nowhere pretty fast. And three weeks into my first semester, 9-11 happened a day that uh, uh, most of us probably remember where we were. And two days later, dropped out of college and joined the Army. The, uh, the second best decision that I've ever made, next to asking my wife to marry me. And um, yeah, really set me on a path to being right here right now. I initially got um, sent over to Germany, and I was assigned as a colonel's driver, right when I joined the <laughs> army. Now, I didn't drop out of college to drive a colonel around, make sure his coffee was hot, carry his bags, right? I had joined up for all those patriotic hoo -ah reasons. And uh, fortunately, I was able to get reassigned um, to an airborne unit. And so I, I became a paratrooper um, stationed with the 173rd Airborne Brigade base out of Vicenza, Italy. So if anybody's ever seen the documentary Restrepo or heard of it, so that was oh, yeah. my unit. That was our last deployment. Um, it's a great first-hand account of what life is like over there. So I highly recommend it. It's called Restrepo, Sebastian Younger, a uh, fantastic writer. And uh, yeah, so that's really where I, I cultivated my leadership skills. I, you know, I went to Iraq once, 12 months, Afghanistan for 12 months, and then Afghanistan for 15 months. And it was during that time, really watching others, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so hopefully you all haven't done this little thing that I want to do for you here, but I just want you guys to follow my directions, okay? Because I want to get the blood flowing. I know everybody's kind of got their drinks and everything, but you got to set it down. Just do what I tell you to do. Put one finger right here. I want you, everybody, two fingers and then three. All right, good job. Now just twirl around. You get the blood kind of going down the arm a little bit. Some of you might have some alcohol going down. Go ahead and put it right there on your chin. <laughs> I saw that, Lori. I saw that. Some of you, right? <laughs> Those of you that put it on your chin, you're like, yeah, what? <laughs> that just shows that an example. IQ test because I just failed. <laughs> <laughs> you know that that's I'm really an example. That was the sobriety test. I'm signing test, off. Right? Now. Signing off now. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know that just shows me of how we tend to mirror the behavior of others around us, for better or for worse. Um, you know, if we're not doing the right things, how can we expect it out of other people? But thankfully, I had some great leaders in the army. Um, that I was able to model and cultivate my own leadership skills and behaviors off of. Um, and I also had some not great leaders. You know, the military is one of the most bureaucratic organizations out there. You wear your rank on your uniform. Uh, many people, from my experiences, think that the military is all about, you know, autocratic leadership and you're leading through your position. It's not like that at all. You can find leaders at every single level, even the lowest ranking, who are not in charge of anything you know, because they stand out because of their behaviors and their actions and being able to influence those around them. And so again, 
And I learned that at a very early age, I was 18 when I went into the military. And it's something that I've just been able to, to take with me here into the civilian world. Because when I think of servant leadership, I, I don't even think of servant. I just, that's leadership to me. That's right. what it is. And, and, you know, there's a lot of different styles and models and tools and, and, and they serve their purpose out there. But at the very basic foundational level, in my opinion, it just comes down to people. And I know I'm not breaking any news for all you guys either. <laughs> um, but it really comes down to people and treating people right. And one of the most influential leaders that I had was a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Post. And he was a platoon leader for us, uh, fresh out of West Point. So still, you know, fresh out of college, um, not a very seasoned officer, but the epitome of what many people would call a servant leader. He is the type of guy that could sit you down and tell you the 12 different ways that you sucked at life. And you would leave that conversation with a smile on your face, ready That's to awesome. charge up that proverbial hill, ready to run through a wall because you knew that he had your best interests in mind. He was going to give you every single resource you needed, or as Laurel said, take barriers out of your way for you so you could be successful. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be there cheering you on every step of the way. And so what was great about John is he really – formed himself as a leader early on with us before we even went to combat. So we all grew to know him, trust him and like him. So when those moments came when we're under fire and we're looking to him for direct for direction, he can sort of turn into that where maybe he is raising his voice or being more direct as what he, you know, would oppose to be when we're not mm -hmm. getting shot at. Right. But we all revered him so much that we just took those orders. We, we snapped too. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because he set the tone early on with us. And, and I think that was important. And he just, again, taught us the value of relationships in a, in a world where everybody wears rank and you sit somewhere on the chain of command that everybody was equal. That's cool. <clears throat> Were there things that he did specifically to build relationships that varied amongst the folks in the unit? Or was he, did he have like a more unilateral approach to that? No, no, he, he definitely was... Um, took time to get to know everybody individually, kind of like you, um, you had mentioned the small things that matter the most. If you ever heard of the butterfly effect, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the smallest things can have the biggest impact in the world. And one of the things that he did for me personally is he got accredited to teach college credit classes to us in Afghanistan. Uh, he oh, went wow. through this all online process. They had to send him forms, all this kind of stuff, so that he could uh, proctor exams and teach us courses because he knew that for myself, I wanted to finish my college degree. Nobody in my family had ever done that. That was something that I wanted to do. So he went and did that. He took Spanish speaking classes while we were deployed because. Uh, for, for example, my squad, five out of seven, as, as a white male, I was a minority. Five out of seven were uh, Puerto Rican guys. And I don't know what it is about Puerto Ricans, but they love jumping out of airplanes because uh, <laughs> even some of my closest friends, but they, they just flocked to being a paratrooper. And so he took time to start to learn Spanish and he didn't become fluent in it, but he showed that effort. And mm -hmm. I mean, they absolutely love that. Being able to do those small things. Um, he was the type of guy that I could turn to if I was having trouble with, um, with a soldier, how to approach him, looking for advice. I could go to him. Um, you know, he's, he's going to kind of squeeze you, put his arm around you, give you advice, but at the same time, not dictate and tell you what you have to do. He's going to let you go out there mm -hmm. and fail sometimes. Um, but not when it comes obviously to, to the life and death stuff, but he, he <laughs> understands, I think, what's best for you in, in letting you kind of carve your own path. Mm -hmm. So I imagine during your time in the military, you had bosses like him and you had bosses that weren't so great. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, go, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, what, what was, if you had to pin it down, what, what's the, the defining characteristic that puts you in one camp or the other? Is there one? As far as which style you lead with? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, the, the leaders that you really connect with mm -hmm. and the leaders that, that just don't connect. Right. Um, again, it just comes down to people and caring about them. And, you know, in the military, like, 
telling somebody you love them and care about them is not something that you often do. Um, but for me, I mean, we all have our own different needs. But for myself, I'm a person that wanted that. I, that was one of my needs, right? Um, uh, and so I guess it depends. But we'd also have soldiers too that like, no, that's not me. They would say, right. I, don't, I don't know if I really believed it. But like, no, no, that's not me. I, I don't want to talk about all this soft, squishy feeling type stuff. Um, mm. So I guess part of it came down to a little bit of preference. You know, mm -hmm. um, you'd have people who would, I always joked, I called it the perpetual cycle of ignorance. They get promoted and they think they need to be the person that yells and raises their voice and you lead through your rank. And that's great if you want compliance, right? If you want right. somebody to do something, but if we want people to tap into that discretionary effort, yeah, it's going to take more because yeah, we want to build high performing teams, right? Everybody wants that. We all want to be performing our best. Well, you need to be able to tap into that discretionary effort where people are actually going to give you that little bit extra because they care and because they want to. Yeah. Yeah. You, you use the phrase, no trust in like earlier. And, and I think that's, that's critical, right? That's, that's the central piece. That's the trust builder. Um, and once you get to that level and, and have some modicum of trust, that's when that magic starts to happen. Right. That, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. So talk to us about leading people in difficult contexts. You, you listed all your tours of duty. I would classify those as probably the most difficult contexts <laughs> under which someone can lead. You literally have life or death stakes in front of you every day. Right. And, um, well, I mean, when it comes down to it, we, we would train as we fight in the military. Mm -hmm. we, we would train like it's the real thing all the time so that you're prepared. Um, but at the same time, too, it's understanding, again, it's knowing your people. I mean, I, I, I try not to make it as simple as it is, but it's knowing your people. It's knowing the person below you and on your right and on your left, what their job is. They know your job so that you guys work as a cohesive team. You know, when I left the military, um, I, I was on a path to working in sports. I got a master's degree in sport management. I went to work for the Minnesota Vikings, my hometown football team, what I thought was my dream job. Um, hopefully there's no Packers fans here besides Ruby. What? <laughs> oh, there's. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the coach actually had me come speak to the team. So I was working in football operations. Um, and so it was a very interesting time because we held an open dialogue. And so I'm speaking to these professional athletes, these you know, best of the best, uh, may not have been the best in the NFL, but uh, very high world-class athletes um, about what it means to be a team. But that team was full of a lot of individuals. And I think it showed up as they played out there on the field, right? Everybody was looking mm. out for themselves. But if you look at high performing teams, if you want to use sports as an analogy, look at some of these great teams. I mean, look at the, the Patriots. If you're familiar with the Patriots, I couldn't name you more than probably five guys on that team, but look at how well they come together. Um, as All a the team. time. Yeah, yeah. They had Tom Brady, but there's such a high level of cons consistency on that team that it's not always all these individuals that are performing alone. They're working as, as a team, as a unit. Um, and myself, I, I think back to my first deployment to Afghanistan. So I was there March of 05 to March of 06. And on June 8th, 2005, things were starting to pick up. So in Afghanistan, um, the Taliban would kind of hibernate for the winter. A lot of the, the mountain passes would be snowed in and everything. Supply lines were cut off, but by June 8th, snow's melting, fighting season is picking up. And so we're getting a resupply of ammunition because we're starting to get busy. And my team, uh, my section was tasked with um, being what's known as a hot gun. So we had to stay back in case we got attacked because the other section was going out to the helicopter to get the ammunition they were bringing us. Mm. And I was going to backfill a position for the other team. So I was going to go help them. And as I heard the helicopter coming in, so my soldier, Emmanuel Hernandez, he hopped in the back. Now, he wasn't supposed to be there. But I thought for a second, you know what? He wants to come lift some heavy boxes, right? Like this is, I value this kind of work ethic, this kind of discretionary effort that he's putting in to do the best that he can, right? To help out any way that he can and to help the team because they were going to be able to do their job without him. 
and, and, and you're was, pinch hitting at this point, right? This I isn't am. even your normal right. gig. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, not my normal gig. And so I turned around and I was going to yell at him that, hey, you're not supposed to be here. But I thought for a second, you know what? I value that. I, I want that in my soldiers. So I didn't say anything. And then, um, you know, I realized he didn't have his helmet on. But I didn't have mine on either. I wasn't doing the right thing. You know, I, I can't yell at him if I'm not doing the right thing. So we got out there. And we had to step to the side of the, of the helicopter. And as we stepped to the side of it, because they had to take a machine gun off the ramp, I got picked up and I was thrown through the air and slammed down to the ground. Mm. I couldn't hear anything. I'm looking around. I'm kind of dazed, had no idea what happened. I see a bunch of blood. I see guys laying on the ground. The helicopter powered down. And then I heard that distinct whistle of an incoming rocket. And it's about seven of them coming in. And so I crawled underneath a Humvee for cover as these rockets are impacting all around us. And obviously, as I'm laying there puckering up, I'm realizing it was a rocket that landed next to us. That's why I'm on the ground. That's what happened. Those rockets landed. I crawled out from under and I started running back to those guys that were still on the ground, you know, really unsure of what I was going to find. And it was as I was running a Marine that was on our base training Afghan National Army soldiers had yelled to me that I'd been hit. Now, up to that point, I hadn't felt any pain, but I turned and I looked at the back of my uniform and it was just shredded and blood was pouring out. And, you know, they talk about the adrenaline and all that kind of stuff. And so when I saw the blood, that's when the pain hit me. Um, and I kind of got a little, little weak in the knees and got down. And so we got um, medical care. There was uh, a group of 10 of us that were standing in that little circle and so they brought us to this small Afghan clinic that was on our base that also treated locals. And so one of the things, this is what we in the military call a mass casualty um, event that we train for, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you can never predict what they're going to look like exactly, obviously, but we train for it. And as somebody who my wounds were very minor compared to everybody else, I had a few holes in my back, a bunch of shrapnel in there. I was going to be okay. Other guys, you know, um, my platoon sergeant had a severed femoral artery in his leg. We put on a tourniquet. That one burst off uh, first because, I mean, the pressure of the blood, right? Uh, they had to strap another one on them. Uh, so there were guys that were very severely hurt. And I'm just watching all of this happen as I'm um, – if you're ever – connect with me on LinkedIn, I got a picture of me. I'm sitting there with a sling. Um, I, I put it on there on like the anniversary and I'm just sitting there watching these guys move like a well-oiled machine, this team of people, some of whom have never worked together, mm. right? We, we've all trained separately, but we, we came from different backgrounds. We had Navy SEALs. We had some CIA people out there. We had uh, mainly Army Green Berets, Special Forces. And I'm watching this well-oiled machine come together there in times of uh, absolute chaos, there's still rockets that are coming in after the initial barrage. Um, we're calling in helicopters to come get the wounded. CPR is being done on a couple guys. And, and I'm just watching this team come together. And it was absolutely amazing to see. Um, and, and so I, I got medevaced out of there. And unfortunately, Emmanuel was killed. He took shrapnel right through his head. And so that's something that, um, you know, I beat myself up about for a very long time. Because I was going to say something, but I didn't. I didn't have that courage to speak up. I wasn't doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I tried to drink it away. I tried to wash it away with pills after I got out of the military, which we we know none of that's going to help. And and that's just served as an accelerant to, you know, some PTSD symptoms and stuff I was already experiencing. And, And it's such a cliche, we can't change the past. But what I really learned is that I'm able to take that story even no matter how tragic it is into organizations and corporations where people are not going to face life and death situations, but they're going to be able to hear that story and understand how our behaviors impact those around us. I've learned that, right. I can't change the past, but I can take that. I can share it with others. Um, and, and that's some of the most impactful work that I've been doing. Eric, uh, Ruby, Moreg, Ben, you know, we all worked on that together and we've seen the, the power that stories and personal connection can have and how it can move the needle with people, what, with people, whether it's something safety related or whether you're just thinking something more general about leadership, um, the power of those personal connections and stories and, and how people can relate to them. And when they see you being vulnerable, um, 
there's yeah. just something about it. it you know we saw it we, we'd see these big alpha male crusty guys who've been in the oil field for 40 years get up there and start crying yeah telling their personal connection their personal story that's the kind of stuff that moves the needle on leadership that's the kind of stuff that lets people know that you care about them and so that's something that i just really always try to encourage people you know share your failures right share I, i've had plenty of them i love sharing them with people um and share, the, share share your wins as well. Um, I, I I love that, Patrick. I I, lo- I love this this notion of of sharing that you care, right? And and for me, that this is the the crux of this service based leadership idea. Um, it's it's you know you keep saying know your people. It's all about the relationships, um, and it is, and it's it's about actually walking that talk right? It's, it's about actually caring. And, you know, you talked about burly oil field guys, right? We, Mm -hmm. we've heard stories from those, from those guys where the behaviors exhibited by the leaders, if, if, (laughs) if you were to tell what they did to people in the oil field boys club, they'd be like, oh yeah, they never did that. That's too soft and fluffy too, Mm -hmm. too touchy feely. Um, but it's those things that actually make the difference. Right. Um, and you know, and I've, I've had the good fortune of hearing that story before. And there are two things I love about that story. You know, one, it's the recognition of, I should have said something. I knew I should have said something in my gut. I knew that that was my move and I didn't make it because I was, not exhibiting the same behavior, right? right. Um, another thing about that story that I like um, that you tell in different contexts is when your CEO let you know what actually happened to Hernandez, he didn't do it right first either. He didn't, no. He, um, so I'll tell you, so I got medevaced to a forward surgical team. They took out a bunch of pieces of shrapnel from my back, left a few souvenirs in there because they were too deep. And then they, they patched me up and sent me out to the landing zone to hop on another helicopter for further medical care at a more advanced facility. And I was waiting there and my commander approached me and he just, you know, he's like, Hey, how you doing? He wanted to check in on me. And I said, Hey, how's Hernandez? And he looked at me and he told me he's going to be okay. And I just, you know, I felt relief because the last I saw him, he was laying on a table, his head was bandaged. He was unconscious, but I saw his chest rise and fall. So I knew that he's breathing. And I just grabbed his hand and, and I, I didn't think he could hear me, but I just told him everything's going to be okay. And then, so my commander said, yeah, he's, he's going to be okay. So he turned to walk away. And I mean, he didn't get more than probably three or four steps and, and turn around and, and tears, you know, coming down his cheek. And he said, I'm sorry that I lied to you. He didn't make it. And, you know, that's, I, it was tough. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, for me, the lesson in that piece of the story is as leaders, we don't always do the right thing. You know, we may have the best interests of the situation in mind, but we don't always do the right thing. And what I love about what your commander did in that situation was he recognized it immediately, owned it, and turned around and, and, and made it okay, made it right. Right. You know, we're 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 feeling our way through this leadership thing every day. Um, so when I hear you tell that story and the nuances within that story, I think of all these lessons. You know, what what other lessons have you taken just from from your time in the service and and your time working with with companies? Um, you know, again, not life and death situations, but a lot of the same human factors in play. What are some of those lessons that you've taken away over the years? Yeah, well, again, I, I'm not breaking news. We all know that leadership is about people, right? We need to treat people right. We know that giving feedback is important and all that great stuff. Like we all know that. So you can describe to me, right? You can describe to me what a great leader looks like because we all know it when we see it, but yet we're not that person. And, and what happens, in, in my opinion and in my experiences, is we got 12,000 other things competing for our attention on a daily basis the, the meetings, the Zoom calls, the, the reports. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And I'm not saying those things aren't important, 
But yet what I've seen tend to happen is we take those things that we know are great, those kind of softer leadership skills of investing uh, time and building relationships with people, and they kind of become a lower priority because we need to meet this, this list of, of uh, you know, these tangible demands that need to get done. Um, and so again, I, I, I just, I really encourage people to, where do you put your priorities when it does come to leadership? Again, I'm not saying you, you got to say, no, nope, I'm not doing any more spreadsheets or, or none of that stuff, because we know that that is a, a reality for many people. Um, but just again, understanding where your priorities are. And I think another big thing for me, um, and again, it's, it's just something so simple is being able to manage your reactions. Um, mm. Especially, you know, okay, that helps in anything. If people ask me, like, what's the one thing you would recommend out of all your experiences that would help me be a better leader right now? Learn how to manage your reactions and use more thought out responses instead. Right. If Dude, you, you just stole teacher, my last question. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you can be able to manage those reactions, and Eric does a great job of talking about the, the neuroscience behind it and this whole amygdala hijack. And, you know, I only play a neuroscientist on webinars. I think Eric actually is a neuroscientist. <laughs> um, but understanding the, the physiology of, of it, why it happens and everything, and then taking steps to be able to control it. Like, if, if you can understand that and it's not bad to have emotions but understanding in situations maybe where they're not the most appropriate and you're not going to serve you the best um and so yeah if you, if you can use some more of a thought out response and said and we you know in, in the business right we call it cognitive discipline yeah i i love that you know that that one thing you know boiling things down to those little golden chestnuts, right? That one thing that you can do differently. Um, so managing your reaction, that's, that's a big deal. Um, when you think about that, Patrick, how do you in those moments when you're hot, right? When, when, when you're in that hijack mode, and your system is flooded with all of the hormones and blood is rushing away from your brain and into your big extremities, how do you recenter? How do you Give yourself a moment to reframe so that you can respond versus react in those situations. That's great. Uh, great question. It's tough and it takes practice. And you may not get it right the first or second or 25th time you do it. Uh, but it takes practice to be able to do that. I think one is recognizing those situations that are going to trigger you. Uh, yeah. We all know what pushes our buttons. We all know what it is. It's different for everybody, uh, but you know what's going to get you going, and, and I certainly know what mine are. So, not that I avoid those situations altogether, but I prepare myself mentally uh, when I'm a, know that I'm going to be faced with them. Uh, you know, for for me, it's just a little. Uh, I, I breathe in for four seconds, I hold it for four seconds, and I exhale for eight. No oh, uh, box breathing. Any, I'm not any type of meditation <laughs> guru or anything. I don't know how or why it works, but it works for me. Uh, and it's awesome. Can you say that, that one that, more time? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's so four four eight is how I learned it through my my program at Pepperdine. You breathe in for four, you hold it for four, and you exhale for eight. You do that, you know, three or four times. I don't know what it is. Again, I don't know why or how, but it works for me. It helps me just be more focused and more intentional um, with situations that I'm in. I love that. It, it, it's actually a technique called box breathing, and it's taught by the CIA to their agents. Interesting. Okay. Because it's the most effective way to calm yourself down mm -hmm. in a crisis. So when they teach this, one of the scenarios is you're kidnapped and you wake up <laughs> duct taped in the trunk of a car. Right. And, uh. and that's when they do the box breathing. Um, yeah. So I love that technique. I love that. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. So again, recognizing knowing those situations where it, it's going to push your buttons. And then I always like to tell the story. I, I don't know if you've shared this one before. Um, but, but I had a former colleague who used to fly F 16s in the air force. Um, he got out and he started flying for Delta airlines. And he said it went from, you know, driving the Corvette to, to driving the school bus practically is what it was like. <laughs> but he asked me one time early on and he said, you know what, one of the first things they taught us in pilot training in fighter pilot training, when an alarm goes off in the cockpit, I said, you probably got to start pushing a bunch of those buttons or you hop on the radio and you're calling Mayday or you eject out of there. I have no idea. He said the very first thing that they taught us to do was to wind the clock. 
because uh. you can't break anything by winding the clock. And it's intentionally making your brain take that even half second pause, overriding that cortisol, everything mm. that's going on in your brain and triggering more of a thought out response instead. And so I like to joke around. I mean, it's honestly worked wonders in my marriage. My wife and I might have some disagreements, <laughs> right? And I want to say something and I just got to get it in because I know it's only going to be to serve me, but I just got to say it. But then I start thinking, okay, that's a wind the clock moment kind of behind my yeah. back. I'm winding the clock. Like, don't you say it you better not. Right. You know, I, so love, just, I love that. Intentionally taking a pause. It's like, you know, we all remember stop, drop and roll. I've remembered wind the clock. Um, yeah. Something that I've kind of always carried with me. That's so funny. I, I love that story. It, it's it's akin to a thing that I used to do, you know, working in HR for 20 plus years. I had the misfortune of laying off over 2,500 people in my life. Um, and one of the things that I learned is that you never know what you're going to get in those meetings. People are going to react as people react. And if someone freaks out, whatever that looks like, whichever emotion presents, the way that I would get them to wind the clock is I always had a piece of paper with their name, address, and, and, and a line for their personal email. And I would slide the paper across the table and I would say, hey, Patrick, can you do me a favor? Can you just verify your address for me and write down the most appropriate personal email for you? Mm -hmm. And that gives them that moment to, to right. wind the clock, right? They can't break anything. They're not going to punch me. I have been punched. Bad scene. Um, but th it gives them the, that moment to just step back and refocus. Right. Even if Absolutely. they didn't choose it. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Patrick, what else would you tell the group here? You know, just thinking about about servant leadership, about showing up in the moment, about actually caring <laughs> about your people. It's funny, Patrick and I were talking this the, before this this meeting about this topic, and it, it was kind of, you know, it's kind of like the light bulb went off. And we were like, is it really this easy? You, you just don't be a jerk, right? As a leader. Um, what's what's one little 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 tip, trick, or tool that you could share with, with the folks here when faced with, with this idea of, of, of checking in and being there and being a servant or service-based leader? Yeah. Um, live with intention. Um, mm. That's... I love that. I mean, especially I think at times like that we're in now, and it's so easy to try to think about when things are going to be normal, what that'll look like. Oh, I can't wait for this, for that live with intention in the moment that you're in now and soak it up. We've got one life here. It's such a cliche, but some of you might've been in some pretty challenging situations where it is life or death. And you understand that, or you've had loved ones close to you, right? Um, soak these moments in no matter how challenging they are right now. And so that's something that I'm finding myself doing because Again, it's not like I go to work and I put on my leadership hat. And I come home and now I'm not a leader anymore, right? I need to be a leader <laughs> for my family, for my friends. Um, and so I'm living with intention with for all those people around me now. I'm, I'm valuing that time that I have with them. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm being very purpose-driven and intentional with how I'm spending it, how I'm investing in those relationships. And so whether you're at work or, or you're at home, I just, again, enjoy it. Even though, yeah, the, uh, uh, on a macro scale, all this sucks, right? But still enjoy the moment because you're going to look back on this time and, and probably wish that maybe you did things a little bit differently. Perspective, man. Perspective from a guy who took an inbound rocket attack. That's this, this as challenging as these times are, these times aren't that. And, you know, Patrick, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your service. Um, thank, thank you for your, your thoughts and your perspective on this topic. Um, folks, anybody have questions for, for Patrick? Uh, anything ab about the topic or in general, you want to give him shit for liking the Vikings? That's fine too, Ruby. <laughs> Any questions for Patrick? Patrick, uh, this is Brian Fink. Uh, you know, thanks for your service, first and foremost. Uh, but just a question for you. you. You mentioned some of the leaders, you know, not only within you know, your chain of command in the military, you mentioned, you know, professional athletes, you mentioned corporate. I'm just curious your thoughts on vulnerability uh, and how, mm. you know, strong leaders show that or don't show that. You know, when I think about a, 
you know, maybe that that Vikings leadership wasn't the right leadership for that team because there was a lot of individuals. But you think about, and again, it's hard to say well, uh, Bill Belichick of how he's perceived by the media, but truly what he's <laughs> like with his players, right? He endears right. his players. He, 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 you know, there's a mutual respect. Um, mm-hmm. And but but do do those best leaders show that vulnerability um, to be able to build those relationships, or they do it at at, at, at purposely at, at different at the right times? Um, it may, may come more naturally. Like obviously, the leader that was on the battlefield with you, right? That was not something that was that was scripted by any sort of imagination, right? So, just curious, your thoughts on that topic? Yeah, that's a great question, Brian. And I, I think for the most part, most people are pretty smart. We can tell when people are being inauthentic, right? When when they're we're, they're faking um, that you know tender moments or that they actually care about you. People can kind of see through that, at least. I like to think that most people can. And so being authentic is key at the same time too. You know, what works for one person isn't going to work for everybody. We all have different needs and how, what we expect out of leadership. Um, again, I, I had some of those, I was in a very alpha male dominated environment as a paratrooper at that time, no females were allowed. I was in combat arms. Um, you know, so it was a, a, a bunch of testosterone filled guys uh, and many of them were just kind of very direct, uh, results oriented, right? If you know DISC, they're, they're, mm-hmm. they're very strong D's on the DISC what? scale. And they just want to get things done, right? This, I mean, the, the, if the shoe fits, right? Um, and so, again, it boils down to understanding your people because yeah. I would understand that I'd have some soldiers where, yeah, I would have to raise my voice a little bit. And, you know, they get it. But I'd have some guys where if I raised my voice, they were going to shut down that was going to be the end of it. Um, And those are the guys that needed to come up and kind of put my arm around and squeeze their shoulder a little bit and talk to them a little bit different. That was one of the the greatest things about serving in the military is being able to work with such a a diverse group of people from literally all over the world. We had a medic from Pakistan, um, you know, people from all over the country that from varying backgrounds and everything. um, And different styles and different needs. And so being able to work Mm -hmm. with them. So again, whether you're going to be more direct with somebody, maybe more like what we might expect from a Bill Belichick, it's understanding your, your people, I guess. Um, yeah. oh, thank awesome. you. Yeah. Hey, you're welcome. Awesome. Hey, hey, Patrick. hey, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Laurel. Okay. Um, I, uh, I threw my, uh, it may look self-serving, but I threw my <laughs> son's book in the uh, chat. Uh, he's a major in the air force. And it's not self-serving because I don't get a dime out of it. But what I um, what I see in you is an amazing humility that goes hand in hand with servant leadership. And it's it's one of the things I admire about my son because even though he's my son, he and I have nothing in common. Um, he's he's his father's uh, child. He's just sure. like him, and. Uh, you know, no one gets um, uh, voted. Uh, you didn't win your bronze star and your purple heart. They were awarded to you. Right. And I think you would have done anything in your power to not have gotten either one. <laughs> Absolutely. And and I don't know of any recipients who think anything different. And right. that sacrifice and that pain that you went through is something that I don't I bet nobody on on this call at least can relate to I just wanted to say thank you and it's that humility that you show that's got to shine through uh, with those guys whether you're putting your arm around their shoulder or whether you're just a little bit in their face right (laughs) and and that's part of being a servant leader it's understanding that difference between mm-hmm. those two guys to know which one works. Right. So again, thank you for your service, but thanks for being just a really great example for us. I, I, I really appreciate that, Laurel. That, that means a lot to me. Thank you so much for your kind words. And I, I, I'm, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to pick up your son's book. Uh, <laughs> one, because I just love history, but two, we've spent enough time, Eric and Ben and Ruby driving in North Dakota <laughs> past all of the, the missile silos with our clients mm-hmm. And so I've just always wanted to read more about them and everything. Uh, I'm actually headed there next week. Um, And so I'm sure I'll I'll see some of those little fenced in areas out there in the middle of nowhere. Uh, So I I look forward to to picking it up. 
you know, and, and you mentioned something um, that just really spoke to me and, and reminded me. So in, in going to Yvonne's comment, as, as she knows Restrepo uh, uh, very well. So three, three living soldiers from my unit received the Medal of Honor, right? The highest wow. decoration you can get for bravery. Uh, and one of them was the very first living soldier since the Vietnam War to receive it. And his name is Sal Junta. And prior to joining the military, Sal worked at Subway, right? He, people didn't look at him when he was a sandwich artist saying, man, that, that kid's going to go get a Medal of <laughs> Honor someday, right? And if you ever talk to Sal or see some of his interviews, he's going to tell you that it, it just comes down to getting the environment right. It's, it's amazing what people can do when you have the environment right, when, when, when the culture in an organization or within a team is right, whether it's literally charging up a hill against a machine gun nest, to rescue your buddy, or whether it's tapping into that discretionary effort so you guys can, can bring in some results in Q3. Um, it's being able to get that culture and environment right and th that you're going to see the results. Awesome. Great. Awesome. <clears throat> couple more comments in the chat for you, Patrick. Karen says, thank you for sharing your amazing story and for your service. Thank you. Truly inspiring. And, and Lori has to bug out. She's got another call, but uh, she will watch the recording later, as does Tina. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, any other questions for Patrick before we, we move on to funny stuff and get you guys on out of here? Just want to say thank you, Patrick. I am I'm so honored to have worked with you and seen you deliver your message and your story in the field. And um, I'm just grateful and thank you for being here today. This I feel like this really resonated for me and I think for all of us. So thank you. I appreciate yeah. that, Ruby. Thank you. Patrick, is there anything that you want to push or plug or or pimp as it relates to loyalty point leadership? while you've got this captive audience in front of you? Yeah, right. You know, uh, trying to start your own business is tough enough. Trying to do it during COVID is a little bit more challenging, but uh, I'm making a go at it. I, I, I'm working on my own. Um, I've got some great mentors here uh, that have helped me along the way. But if, uh, if you ever know anybody that just needs one, needs to hear an inspirational message, whether it's virtual or in person, I love doing that. I love being able to share my experiences to be able to help inspire others. And at the same time, too, I'm very passionate, like all of us are here about leadership development. Um, and I, I always love bringing in my own stories, my own experiences to really make that, that content come to life. I always like to joke around, you know, I, I've been in the military where they will PowerPoint you to death, where I've had to sit through training for eight hours a day. And I'm very empathetic. I know what it's like when people do have to sit through mandatory training. And so love to make it, you know, engaging and out of your seat and uh, practical, but at the same time too sustainable because it's one thing to bring somebody in that, you know, you can do a great job and you can leave everybody kind of entertained, but it's kind of like that sunburn. It kind of wears off after a few days, <laughs> but actually bring in sustainability behind your message is something I really pride myself on. So find me on LinkedIn, Patrick Nelson, Loyalty Point Leadership. Uh, I, I'd love to connect and, and just be a resource for you going forward. Awesome. Thank well, thanks, you, Patrick. Yeah, thanks for being here today. Thanks for sharing your story. Powerful stuff. Really, really appreciate it. All right. I know we're, we're slightly over time, but that's because our, our interview today was so engaging and amazing. Funny stuff for today. I was kind of going on that same kid theme that we did last week because that was kind of fun for me. So life at home with kids. Number one, it's funny how the floor, the counter, and the kitchen become my floors, my counter, and my kitchen once you start cleaning them. Funny thing number two, my toddler held my hand all the way to the bathroom, gave me a kiss when I sat down, then stole the toilet paper roll and ran out of the bathroom laughing in case you're wondering what it's like to be a parent. Oh my. <laughs> Funny thing number three, my daughter had a spider in her room, but she lost it and now she wants to move. I told her to stop being dramatic. She would probably just swallow it tonight, so no big deal. Oh my God. <laughs> and oh, that God, child will have <laughs> therapy for the next 20 years. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's nightmare city. So <laughs> exactly. waking up at 3 a.m. for the next two weeks. Exactly. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> there, there are a couple of off-color ones in here today for you Imagine prim and that. proper HR types. Laurel. My son just told my neighbor that mommy likes to eat hard meat because we had some accidentally burned sausages for dinner. So we're moving now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Another one. <laughs> had to remind my five-year-old to watch her knee around my groin. She asked what a groin is. As I began to answer, her, she interrupted with, oh, your vagina, and then ran off laughing. I still haven't recovered. <laughs> Oh, my. Uh, telling my six-year-old about homeschooling for the next couple months, and he asked if I had to do that when I was a kid, and I said no. And then he asked if chairs were even invented yet. So the first thing I think we'll study is his fucking attitude. <laughs> uh, my, favorite, oh. my favorite one of the day, because I'm the father of teenage girls. Mm, lucky you never ask, never ask your teenager how you look today unless you're prepared for them to say shit like you look amish or you look like you sell essential oils and don't vaccinate your kids <laughs> yeah thanks <laughs> uh, oh my. And today today's semi-quarantine cocktail is the fall is probably canceled too this is a riff on fireball sangria you need a Granny Smith apple and maybe some football and orange. I give schools about a month, a blood orange. And a sheriff in Florida actually banned masks in the sheriff's office for employees and visitors. You need a little fireball whiskey. It's Florida. What do you, what do you do? Uh, you, you need, uh, <laughs> you need you three moved quarters to Michigan, of Michigan. That's what you do. <laughs> 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 you need three quarters of a cup of apple juice, not three Point seconds of, order, of a cup. Three yeah, over yes. two is not a third of a cup of yeah. apple juice. It's three fourths is what you need. That was should be a four. <laughs> How many um, of these had you drank when you were yeah, writing yeah. up this, in, this recipe? <laughs> Clearly, he got stuck on the fireball line. Shut up, Ben. <laughs> um, missed you, buddy. <laughs> dude, someone shot a helicopter in my hometown today. They shot at an Air Force helicopter. Your and it's hometown not even in, in Virginia or here in Colorado? In Manassas? Virginia. Oh, okay. Yes. Nice, nice memory, Millsy. Yeah. I still got it, Manassas, baby. Virginia. Yeah. For fuck's sake. I don't even know what to <laughs> yeah, say. <really? laughs> I don't even know what to say. I do want to say, Laurel Ditson, as I live and breathe, I don't think I have teared up on a bartender yet. And you did that today. You. You oh. did that. You, the one with the raunchy comment, always at the ready. Um, <laughs> you had some real things to say today, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Great, great moments today, too. Um, but just to be raunchy, have you guys ever played the Florida game, the Florida man game on Google? Oh. Yes. Oh, yeah, it's awesome. Cuts. I don't know what it is. Yes. Cuts. Cuts. Yes. Oh, no, it's great. No, it's great. That, no. All you do is type in Florida in Google, Florida man, and then your birthday. Because there's always something in Florida. Don't put a year. There's do it right always, now. Do it right now, yeah, Laura. Do, do it. it. Okay, so, and then, my and then so just a month in the day. So the first one that comes up for me, and, and you can do this, Florida man, January 9, Florida man says the three syringes found in his rectum are not his. <laughs> <laughs> Here's mine. Florida man gets headbutted by alligator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay. And a Florida man accused of stealing butt. Too embarrassed to pay for it. <laughs> okay, Florida Laurel. man arrested for having sex with stuffed Olaf at Target. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I wonder if he got sued That's by Disney or Pixar. Murder over imaginary girlfriend. Oh my God. Oh God. So my man Florida man who threw toilet through window in East St. Louis found with septic <laughs> <laughs> oh, this what? one's good. Florida man arrested for attacking mom with breakfast. <laughs> with breakfast. Breakfast. <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> My birthday. Oh, stuff is like going off. 
I, I get handing out marijuana to passerby. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> I get I get sh- shirtless man rides motorcycle down highway while lying on his back. <laughs> Hold on. Is he wearing a helmet? No, he's not. <laughs> what you got? Uh, what you got, oh, Leah? Florida man high on ecstasy ends up stranded in the middle of the lake, cops say. <laughs> <laughs> Me with the swans. <laughs> wow. Mine was a Florida man was sentenced to 10 days in jail and moral recognition therapy on Monday <laughs> as punishment for attacking a worker dressed as a minion <laughs> character in Daytona Beach. Oh my God. <laughs> that one's in <laughs> Oh my Jail God. and moral therapy. Yeah. Moral therapy. <laughs> While dressed right. as a minion. I mean, haven't we all been there, really? Seriously. <laughs> Mine says Florida oh, man thought he so stole much. opioids, got laxatives instead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is being Mistake stupid a crime? You make only once. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound like a crime to me. <laughs> Stupid, stupid does. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. Good one. Guys, Have thank you so off. much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Patrick. thank you so thank much you, for joining us today. If you had a good time and learned a thing or two at today's happy hour, please share it with your friends. If you want to join our tribe, head on over to skyteam.cloud forward slash TCB or email us at info at skyteam.com. That's S K Y E team.com. Thanks again, and remember, you've always got friends at the Corporate Bartender.